are in week one of class two of systematic theology. And we're going to pick up with the doctrine of the word. Um, I just want to let you uh, be aware of how the, the book is laid out. So at the end of each chapter, if you uh, do have your book with you, on page 42, 40, I think, um, is where there is the questions. And usually there's one to four questions for personal application. And like that's what I'm looking at, you know, to just write something uh, in the chat about that. Um, there's also special terms there. Uh, again, apologetics, that's when I always have a problem with, because I'm always thinking you're apologizing, you know, but it's nothing about apologizing. <laughs> it's the disciplined study of the word to be able to defend from or convert non-believers. So it's just about, you know, knowing what you're uh, what it's about. Um, there's also uh, some scripture. Uh, I highly recommend, it's not part of the class, you don't have to do it for credit or anything, but um, what I've learned from the school is if you can memorize the scripture and it, when you need it, because you're not going to always have your Bible with you, I mean, it's right. on your phone, you probably can do it, but sometimes, you know, just that Bible verse. And so, um, you have your book open, why don't you go ahead and um, read the Bible verse on page 42, it's Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am always with you to the close of the age. Fantastic. And this is known as the Great Commission. It's a command. Go, and I am with you always. Go and do. Baptize. And again, he's addressing them. This is the upper room. Me on this, you guys might know a little bit off to my research session, but again, it's definitely to the disciples that are new people and maybe some of the followers beyond that. And it, again, they included hymns, which is kind of interesting. This one, um, hopefully, a lot of you know, over a thousand tons to sing. It's um, uh, Charles Wesley in the 1700s. Um, he's a famous, I think, he's written like thousands of songs, you know, about the, the church doctrine. And during the break, we were talking a little bit about music and how it affects uh, you know, different people and different you know, genres that they like or whatever. Somebody might like one side, but then they hear something else that's grating on them or whatever. But um, it says here in the back of the, the hymn, systematic theology at its best will result in praise. So the more you get into it, you know, you're going to have joy in your heart and singing. And it even says it's a challenge to modern songwriters. So as you're going through it, saying too how jazz affects you and you're seeing colors and all that it's really a, a voice of the soul so read through the, these hymns um, because they're messages of God too and it was what they were doing in the church back then because a lot of people didn't read so they were memorizing the songs and uh, Martin Luther when he had the Reformation uh, he was very prolific at getting music written and he had the, the words because he was trying to get the people to learn Bible, and they only knew like the tavern songs. So a lot of the songs, like you know, we were talking about, oh, we only have uh, what do you call it, metal church or something like uh, that. Church. But you go with whatever they know, and then you bring in, and then they're going to be whistling the happy tune, you know, <laughs> and do, yeah. you know, I'm swipe so up. Alright. Yeah. 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 So like I said, if you can memorize, even if you don't know word for word, just remember the Great Commission is go, baptize, and take the word to the world. And that means all the world, the Gentiles as well. Because it wasn't just for the Jews. They were supposed to be the examples and they're supposed to go to the whole world. All right. Um, okay, next. Okay, the word of God. What are the different forms of the word of God? The Word of God, this big W, is as a person, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the Bible refers to the Son of God as the Word of God in Revelation 19.13. These are just, um, I have them written here and I just put them on the page there for you. 
But John sees the risen Lord um, in heaven and says, the name by which he is called is the word of God. John 1.1, 1, 1, of course, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. I had heard that all growing up, that I know it's Jesus, and the Holy Spirit was there too, all three of them. Trinity is a doctrine that we'll, we'll talk about later too. And John 1, 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We have beheld his glory, glory as of the Son from the Father. Also, God's decrees. Sometimes God's words take the form of powerful decrees that cause events to happen or even cause things into being, such as in Genesis. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Or the Psalms, 33, 6. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and all their host by the breath of his mouth. The host are the angels. God's word of personal address. Sometimes God communicates with people on earth by speaking directly to them. Um, it was clear to the hearers that these were the actual words of God, as I had shared um, on my uh, personal testimony off the recording. Um, they were hearing God's very voice. And they were hearing words that had absolute divine authority and that they were absolutely trustworthy. To disbelieve or disobey would have been sin. And God did know, because that was like eight years ago, as of August 12th, mm -hmm. right, August 16th, 2012. And yes, my whole life was completely amazing. Amazing how that happened. <laughs> All right, Genesis 2, 16 through 17. God speaks to Adam, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it you shall die. Of course, there's Exodus, where God gives Moses the Ten Commandments. And then Matthew 3, 13, 3 17, at Jesus' baptism in the Jordan River, God the Father spoke with a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And a lot of these, hopefully you already kind of know them. For me, I understood the Bible verses, but it's been fun knowing the, um, the actual source of it too. Because when you have somebody who comes up and wants to debate the Bible, then you can say, and that's the biggest thing. Go, say, hold on just a minute, go on your Bible app, and this is where it's written. You know, it's not you, God yeah. said. God said. And the more you show them, because then, because they'll just like, oh, well, you're a human, and you can be, you know, happy one day, sad the next. But if you go to the source, and they keep seeing that, and they say, well, let's see what God says about killing babies. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, having floods, and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. All right. So God's word as speech <clears throat> through human lips. Frequently in scripture, God raises up prophets through whom he speaks. God's words lost no authority. Jeremiah 1.9, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. And now, with you having the Holy Spirit with you, um, like tonight, I had some quiet time. And I said, This is you, God. You know, you have to do it. I have no idea where this is going. I mean, I have an outline, but whatever is coming out is of God. And this was probably done, you know, this was done like a year ago, because I was supposed to teach this in February. So God was speaking way back then, knowing that we would be here today. And I've even had experiences where I have got, gotten up in front of people to speak, and I've prayed about God, you know, let me be your vessel mm -hmm. to say whatever they need to hear, and vice versa. And people will come up to me afterwards and say, oh, thank you for that message, that was so great, this point here is just like, I don't think I said that. You know? <laughs> that is probably the 10th like, time I've heard somebody say that this week. Different speakers talking about the exact same thing. Uh-huh. Yeah. The 10th yeah. time this week, yeah. Yeah, so it's, see, there's something going through and what is in your heart and what you're ready to hear. And it's like, okay, that's God. I call those GM, God moments. Yeah. All right, and then we've got God's words, of course, in written form the Bible. And uh, Exodus. Exodus 31:18, the Ten Commandments on two tablets of stone written with the finger of God. And that's kind of poetic, you know, there, but we all know where that's coming from. Um, Moses wrote this law, gave it to the priests, the sons of Levi, again in Deuteronomy, take this book of the law and put it by the side of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, 
that it may be there for a witness against you to be read every seven years. John 14, 26, Jesus, Jesus promises his disciples that the Holy Spirit would bring to their remembrance the words that were spoken while they were learning those three years. We were just talking about that, that, that other one. And then, of course, 1 Corinthians, Paul, I love him. Paul can say that the very words he writes to the Corinthians are a command of the Lord. And he wrote a lot of words. He wrote like 14 of the New Testament books, I believe. You guys yeah. double fact check you. So the focus of our study, let me know if I'm supposed to, okay, yeah. Um, the God, uh, God's Word in written form, that's what we're going to work on. We're going to work on the Bible. And it's available for study, for public inspection, for repeated examination, and as a basis for mutual discussion. He wants us to talk. He wants us to question. He wants us to come fully understanding who he is. Because then you're just amazed, you know, as we have to break down some at all the love that he's given to us, to me. Um, Psalms 112, the man is blessed who meditates on God's law day and night. Joshua 1.8, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate it on a day and night, that you may be careful to do all that is written in it, for then you shall make your way prosperous and you shall have good success. And then we'll go into the New Testament. 2 Timothy 3.16, who was one of the youngest church pastors, um, Paul sent him on his way to uh, set up a church. And uh, it is the word of God in the form of written scripture that is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And again, God disciplines us. And we have this negative connotation of discipline because when we were raised, maybe by a parent that wasn't, you know, loving with the discipline. <laughs> so to speak, you know, and they did the best they can, because they're human too. Um, they did the best with what they had at the time. But um, God's discipline isn't like that. He is disciplining us to care and love, because he wants the best for us. So if we're going off the path, yeah, you're going to feel that pain. That's his little signal. Say, like, mm, you're going off the path. You want to go that way? You might want to come back. And if we keep saying no to that, that's our stubbornness and our hard-heartedness, and we keep going, going, going. And then it's either takes a big moment, you know, of the uh, deal breaker or whatever to get you back on the path, thankfully for that, or you just keep going. <coughs> your heart is so hard. Um, okay, so we have. So oh, God, God opened my eyes this afternoon as I was reading this. I always thought, you know, uh, when Paul on the road to Damascus, you know, was called, and then after he was called, he went for three years and, and was, you know, kind of got his training, his discipling from the Holy Spirit. And the disciples were with Jesus for three years. But, you know, what, what God revealed to me this morning or this afternoon, Moses went on the mountain with, with God himself. And the finger of God wrote the tablets. How, didn't Moses, am I wrong here, but wasn't Moses on the mountain for like three days before he came down? What? How long was Moses was up like there? 40. 40. 40. 40. Yeah, oh, 40. Yeah, that's why the Israelites got out of hand. Yeah, yeah. 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 that's right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. But to be in a Bible class or be in a, you know, let's just, let me just call it that, a Bible class with God as your instructor. You know, Moses sat there in front of him for 40 days, and, and you know, and of course, that gives him the God fills him with the writings for Genesis X. Yes, the first five books of the Bible, I yeah. believe. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's just when you think about that, you know, God is your teacher, you oh, know, gosh. personal teacher. Yeah, that's and God called him his friend. Yes. yes. And there, there could be a whole study on that too, because there, from the very beginning, God was placing Moses in Pharaoh, which was the civilization of the world at the time, as a baby, and pulled right into Pharaoh's household, and got educated, and yeah. was like the son of, you know, inheriting the, the nation and everything like that. And so his mind with the laws and everything that was coming into no. Egypt, I mean, you guys need to write a paper on something for another class. 
So believe it or not, that's the end of chapter two. (laughs) The word of God, all right. Jesus is the main thing. And so, um, Brian, you've got your book too. So we're on page 52 if you could read that scripture. Psalm 1, 1 and 2. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the ways of the sinners, nor sits in the seats of the scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Very good. And I guess the Jewish people would even um, have uh, like a box or something on the top of their forehead that had scripture. Do you know what they're called? We learned about them like three times last month. Oh, okay. Starts with a P. <laughs> oh, okay. But it, it was like they actually had the words with them. Mm-hmm. And so it was right there. So, you know, you can't get past that. But it's there. And they probably had it memorized, you know. So. It's going to try to be crazy. And they even had maybe things in their robes, too, sewn in, you know. So they actually kept it with them. And then the hymn for this one is Break Thou the Bread of Life. That's another one. Um, and to remember here, uh, bread of life, um, it's not the physical bread, but the spiritual bread, nourishing our souls. So give us this day our daily bread. Mm-hmm. It's for the physical, word. but it's also for the, the soul and the spirit. And that's the word, the Bible. Right. Yeah. And um, yeah, man can't live on bread alone. Yes. And then there's Christ the is God. the living word. That's why when uh, you have your communion or your um, uh, the Eucharist, whatever, it's like break the bread in remembrance of me. Right. And then also drink the wine. Right. So. All right. Chapter yes. three. Was there a question? Phylacteries. Yes, there it is. What did you have to go? Oh my gosh, no wonder. <laughs> yeah, I knew I could yep. say it. I just said it started with P. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it's Hebrew, right? <laughs> All right, so chapter three. So now we're in the canon of scriptures. So who can give me a definition of what canon means? Are you familiar with that terminology? I'm sure you've heard of it. Yeah. They don't want ships? Yes, big boom. <laughs> yes. Sheree, what do you think a canon is? Um, the, the fundamental belief system. Yes, the standard. And I believe it's um, actually like a Greek word for standard. And that was a measuring, it was like a reed, it was called a canon for measuring, you know, a certain, um, that was like, how that, like we have the atomic clock for timing and, you know, there's certain things like in France where they have this is the foot or whatever, yeah. the meter and anything like that. So that's really all it is, is canon. And what they've gone through is they went through all the Bible and made sure, you know, because Writings came from all over the place. You know, it wasn't organized. The Bible wasn't there with Paul, and it's like, here it is. You know, they really only had the Torah, and you know, which was the first five books of the, the Bible, and then some of the laws of the Jewish nation yeah. and everything like that was all in there. So, so um, here we're asking what belongs in the Bible and what does not belong. All right, the canon of Scripture is the list of all the books that belong in the Bible, and who knows how many books there are in the Bible? Sixty-six. Very good. How many are in the New Testament and how many are in the Old Testament? New Testament. 39 old and uh, 27. I got to do the math. 39 plus what? 66? (laughs) (laughs) 27. 27. 27. Yeah. Yes. Hands, hands, hands. Okay. Okay. Remember that. Final exam. (laughs) Okay. So see, it's not going to be that But you know, the people out on the street, if you don't know that, you know, basic one, and this is your age group, come on. (laughs) No, I don't know. It is what it is. (laughs) All right, so the canon of scripture is the list of all the books that belong in the Bible. So how do we get there? Well, Deuteronomy, Moses to the people of Israel, in reference to God's law, for it is no trifle for you, but it is your life. So it's very important to know what's the right books. Moses also warned in Deuteronomy, he warned the Israelites, you shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it. And uh, the Old Testament canon, the prophets, in Greek, canon, here we go, means rule or measuring stick, a reed used as an ancient standard of measure. 
Um, so the Old Testament canon, obviously, are the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. The Pentateuch, which just is a fancy name, Penta is five, and then I guess two must be books or written something. But Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, and they are Genesis, Genesis Exodus, Deuteronomy, uh, Leviticus, 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 Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. So Genesis <laughs> is obviously the creation of the world and everything like that, and, and it has the flood in it, and, right. and you know Cain and Abel and all that sort of thing. Right. And then we go Genesis, Exodus, Exodus obviously, um, on you know, and Abraham's in Genesis, and Lot and all that, Sodom and Gomorrah, and then um, Joseph is the one that gets down to Egypt, right. and then Abraham comes to Egypt. So then they all go to Egypt because it's the famine. And then, so that's Genesis. Then Exodus is 400 years later, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> they were yeah. in slavery, right. which is kind of similar to what we're experiencing with the African Americans. And I had no idea it was 400 years in America with slavery coming here, yeah. which was kind of interesting to hear that parallelism. But anyway, Exodus is 400 years of the Israelites being in slavery. And actually, they, they came with being friends with the Pharaoh, because mm -hmm. Joseph was right at the top. Mm -hmm. But then over time, mm -hmm. 400 years, yeah, sure. and they multiplied, and they were prosperous. And then the Egyptians got jealous mm -hmm. and started, you know, Pharaoh came later. And so anyway, yeah, so then you've got Exodus. Moses comes in and takes them out and mm -hmm. takes them to the Promised Land. Um, Exodus, yes, Exodus. Well, Leviticus. That's the laws, because the Levites were the chosen tribe to handle the laws and the temple and all that stuff, the tabernacle. Right. Then you get numbers. What do you think numbers is all about? Numbers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, remember. Go ahead, Casey. Um, it's, it starts the plot, their growth. It's Israel being numbered in its different tribes and their divisions and responsibilities. Some of that's covered in Exodus, and then Numbers is part story, part doctrine. It's got a lot of its own rehash, but part of where it's Numbers is it's beginning to look at the number of things, who they are as a people, and their multiplication as well. I know there's another specific meaning to Numbers, but it's been easy to remember that those things go into it. Very good. And Numbers, remember, because we have our Exodus, and they were stubborn, so they're wandering for 40 years. And now at this point, they're getting ready to go into the promised land. So the first thing they need to do is number everybody. And they're probably counting the males, you know, because they're trying to figure out their soldiers and their military and all this sort of thing. And when they left, gosh, how many? They left with 2 million people, something like that, came out of Egypt. So they did multiply from Abraham's 70 years. family, yeah. you know, that came in. And you know, it was like 2 million at it, counting everything, and all the flocks and everything, but they were numbering everybody, and at the beginning of Numbers, where I was saying this famous statement, that they took 40 years to make a journey of 11 days. <laughs> I never read Numbers, because I always skipped over it. I thought it was like census, and, and, you know, counting populations. It was like, it begat, begat, yeah. this is 124,000 in the tribe of Judah. Like, ah, skip this. But in the very first chapter, it says, you know, this is what's going on. We're numbering everybody because we're getting ready to go in and do the, the Lord's duty to clean out Canaan. And that's another thing that the people outside will say, oh, well, God is vengeful God. He came in and he took over this land and he stole it. Well, the reason why is because Canaan was taking every vice and making it into a religion and a sacrifice to God. They were killing babies. They were prostitution. All this crap was going on. So, you know, that's what was going on. That's why it's in dominion. And then the last one was Deuteronomy. Mm, I gotta think about what that stands for again. What does Deuteronomy stand for? Deuter. So I think the second of something. Let's see if I've got it in my back of this one. I might have it in my notes too. It means the second of something. Do I have that? Deuteronomy? Anybody know? Um, I might have it. Second law. Second law. Second law. Very good. Okay, thanks. All right, so that's a brief, you know, as we're learning the lay of the land for the, the, the Pentateuch. Okay, so we're talking about the Old Testament canon. So then we have the prophets, the various books of the prophets. You know, Samuel, Samuel was the first one. He's the one that goes out and, um, you know, anoints Saul to be the first king, and then David later. 
Um, but Nathan, Gad, Jehu, Isaiah, etc., and all those through whom God spoke. The last Old Testament canon was written in 435 BC. These are the books of the last prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Um, they have various, you know, this is about 500 BC. And then Old Testament history is Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. That's when they go back and uh, they come out of the, uh, when the Babylonians took away from Jerusalem and Jerusalem was completely destroyed. And they were in exile for 70 years. And then they get to go back with Ezra and Nehemiah uh, going back to Jerusalem to build uh, the temple and build the city back up. And Esther, of course, is the queen that's part of the Persian Empire um, of Xerxes and Artaxerxes or whatever. And so very, very interesting um, stories there. Okay, so let's... Where's, does Job get listed in with the prophets? Because isn't he like one of the first books written? Yes, Job is the first book. The oldest. The oldest. The oldest. So right. where yes. where does that fit into that? Um, Job's in poetry. Job's in, it's in poetry. Well, I had etc. Yeah, yeah, maybe it's poetry. poetry. Job, yeah, Job's, Job's poetry. poetry. Yeah. yeah. There's uh, poetry, like prophets, and poetry. Um, Psalms, 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 Psalms. So when you have what they call, uh, so Psalms, when it came down to breakdown, where you had uh, the law and the prophets, Prophets was broken up into writings and prophets, like they had subdivisions. So whenever you read the New Testament, and Jesus or people say the law and the prophets, they're talking about the entire Old Testament because the law is the first five, and then the prophets, essentially all those things, are written or inspired by or dealt with the prophets because that can be broken into its own two subgroups of actual prophecies and the writings, and the writings is broken into history and poetry. So they all follow. Good point. Yeah, the history is the Chronicles one and two, and then the, like you say, the yeah. poetry is the like Psalms. Yeah, there's twelve and, books that are right. considered history. Yeah. Most of whom are most of which are written by prophetic or, or uh, officials, prophetic figures. Gotcha. Typically, the prophets are coming in saying you messed up again, but this is the way back to the Lord. If you want right. to go here, and if you don't, well, this right. is what's going to happen to you. Because he always gives them warnings, and that would be interesting. Because also. Trace, like how many times up and down Israel goes? I don't know. I've never done it. You've got to track because there's so many times you just lose track of it. Several. <laughs> <laughs> but they're supposed to be forgiven seven times 70, right? 490 mm -hmm. times or whatever. So, all right. Okay, so, <clears throat> so now we're into another name that I always have a problem with the books of the Apocrypha. Mm -hmm. You guys heard about that? Yeah. Okay. Um, it means things that are hidden. And another one is they're human breathed, not God breathed or God inspired. So this is the, the group of books, believe it or not, and I didn't realize there were other Bibles out there. Because <laughs> there's, you know, the Bible, and then there's like the Catholic Bible, mm -hmm. and there's extra books in there like the Maccabees That's and Susanna right. yeah. and all that. So those are kind of called the Apocrypha. Because the ones that are in the Bible are the ones that are doctrine related. Right. And one of the part things, of the canon. say again? Right, part of the canon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, um, well, does, don't, don't, don't the Roman canon. Catholics have their own canon, though? Mm -hmm. like, no? Is it a, what they consider canon to themselves is canon plus extra. Yeah. So to them, they believe, like, well, we believe these are real and inspired, divinely inspired, too. Gotcha. And same with the Catholic Church, they have additional books that they also believe are, so their Bible has extra books. Right. It says the two, I believe. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So here it says, like, um, so the books of the Apocrypha, like I said, was uh, things that are hidden in the mile right page. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. So it includes Jewish history after 435, because really the Old Testament stops at 40, 435 B.C., plus the books in the Roman Catholic Bible. So it's a little bit of both. Um, Josephus, he was like a historian um, back then, considered the Apocrypha not worthy because of the failure of the exact succession of the prophets. So you know, they're, they're, they had their little checklist on yeah. what they needed to do when they went to these different councils. We'll get into that shortly here. Jesus and the New Testament authors quote various parts of the Old Testament as divinely authoritative over 295 times, but not once 
do Jesus or the New Testament authors cite the Apocrypha or any other writings as having divine authority? So again, remember when we're doing doctrine, you're going to find it say, okay, like right now, you know, we're we're finding things amazingly, you know, how we can get into caves and finding Dead Sea Scrolls and who knows whatever, you know, uh, pieces of writings in the trash pile of, of uh, civilizations long ago that are quotes out of Isaiah and stuff like that. But if they would find like a new book, like I think maybe they found something that they think Peter wrote, I'm not sure, mm -hmm. don't quote me on that. But this would be what, you know, the modern day Bible scholars would come together and then they would put it through the test and say, where else in the Bible is this? And if there is substantiation and a theme and all that, you know, uh, passes muster, so to speak, then they might bring it in to like somebody was saying, can there be more? But God in the Bible said there will be nothing added or yeah, taken away. away right? It's already there. Mm -hmm. And actually, that is at the end of Revelation 2, mm -hmm. if you look at that. Anybody who adds to it or takes away is like cursed. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's pretty powerful, you know, so. Mm -hmm. And that's written by John, that's a revelation, mm -hmm. given to John, and he was right. the beloved disciple of yeah. Jesus, so the closest, and he lived the longest. And he was the one that was exiled on Patmos. Um, yeah. Patmos. Mm -hmm. And so he had all this time to write this stuff, because he wrote a lot of books too, you know, John 1 through 3, and John, an John itself, and Revelation. Yeah. Okay, so then we're into the mm -hmm. Roman Catholic yeah. Church part of, part of this. Again? Yeah, I'm saying like 90 in, uh, in exile. Uh, you know, I, I don't remember his. I was just yeah. trying to figure out how old he was when he was sitting out there. Yeah, I'm um, not sure. Yeah, so. old. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, they added the Apocrypha to their canon, and this was in response to Martin Luther's teachings and the spreading Protestant Reformation. And because the Apocrypha supported their teaching of prayers for the dead and justification by faith plus works, not by faith alone. So yeah, so Martin Luther is staying with the Bible because he's really, you know, he was like a lawyer. He was into it and everything. And and uh, if you ever have a, a chance to read his book, uh, it's called Here I Stand, because he had to go. Uh, it's, it's an amazing, amazing story, Martin Luther. You can go back into him at some point. I won't spoil the story for you. But he was going off, and you know, because of him translating. This is at the time of the 1500s and the Gutenberg press is coming out, and one of the first things they want to do is the Bible, and they want to put it in the language of the people. Well, the Catholic Church was the one charged, and they had Latin, you know, and that was to kind of keep the masses not knowing what, what you know, to read the Bible themselves, they had to go through this intermediary, and like they say here, you know, their whole thing was about um, that uh, they could pray for the dead, get them out of hell, supposedly, and then justification is just um, a way of cleansing ourselves. It was by faith, which is what we believe in, but also by works. And you cannot earn your way into, into heaven by works. You know, it's by grace. Right. And that was the secret passage that Martin Luther came across when he was translating the Bible from Latin into German. And then all of a sudden he had this inspiration and said, oh my gosh, and all the stuff that the Catholic Church was doing at the time with indulgences, you know, we had to pay. And they were raising money to build St. Peter's Basilica yeah. in Rome, you know, if that's what they were trying to do. But um, but yeah, so they were going down the wrong path. That was the big thing, and that's where the break of the Reformation the church comes. A little bit of background on history there. Um, it's extra, but we won't charge you for that. <laughs> All right, so, okay, so here's who Josephus is. He was born um, 37 AD. He's the greatest Jewish historian of the first century considered the Apocrypha not worthy because of the failure of the exact succession of the prophets. We talked about that. Um, rabbinic Jewish literature, the Talmud, um, that comes after the latter prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, who died. Um, the Holy Spirit departed from Israel, but they still availed themselves of the bath bowl, which is voice from heaven, that must be Hebrew. So that's the Talmud. That's where they're adding more prophets after the Old Testament. Then there's the Qumran community, which was a Jewish sect left behind the Dead Sea Scrolls that we mentioned. They also awaited a prophet. And then the New Testament, there's no dispute between Jesus and the Jews over the extent of the Old Testament canon. And this is where they were saying about the, the quotes. Um, Jerome's Latin Gulgate translation of the Bible was completed in 404 AD. It supported inclusion 
as they were not books of the canon, but merely books of the church. We're still talking about the Apocrypha. That were helpful and useful for believers. And then there's Melito, Bishop of Sardis, 8170. He's the earliest Christian list of the Old Testament books. Um, Esther and the Apocrypha are not included. And there's a couple of few other ones that are mentioned there too. But then what happens, um, the Council of Trent, um, in 1546, that's the Roman Catholic Church officially added the Apocrypha to the canon in response to the teachings of Martin Luther and the rapidly spreading Protestant Reformation because the Apocrypha supported their teaching of prayers for the dead and justification by faith, plus works not by faith alone. So I kind of repeat myself there. Um, I apologize, this is kind of my first time through, but apparently the Lord wants us to hear twice. <laughs> yeah. so, three times the charm. All right. So now we're into um, the New Testament uh, canon. It begins with the writings of the apostles. Okay? So the writing of scripture primarily occurs in connection with God's great acts and redemptive history. So it's not, you know, the daily diary, so to speak, but it's mainly to learn from other people and how God works through their, their lives. The Old Testament records and interprets for us the calling of Abraham, and the lives of his descendants, the exodus from Egypt and the wilderness wanderings, the establishment of God's people in the land of Canaan, the establishment of the monarchy, that's the kings, first and second kings, and Samuel, you know, with yeah. the, the uh, preacher that's uh, anoints them, and then of course the exile, the Babylonian exile, um, and the return from captivity back to Jerusalem. The Old Testament closes with the expectation of the coming Messiah in Malachi, which is a beautiful book, and it's not very long. Okay, yeah. um, a lot of that's read at Christmas time. Yeah. Um, and then there's a natural break between the Old Testament and New Testament of about 400 plus years. It's, it's 400. Maybe that's when he's circling through the orbit of the cosmos. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> so let's see. That Maybe that's why 2000. <laughs> Um, years as it, we'll never know. I'm just kidding there. Um, so it picks up with the birth of Jesus, the Messiah. And then the New Testament consists of the writing of the apostles, who are, you know, the followers of Jesus, the disciples, and then they go on to be apostles. And it's, apostles is just a word, um, it's a Roman word, apparently. Um, when Roman generals would go, like, into a new territory or a country or something, they would send apostles to go and set up, you know, water and food and all this, and they were, you know, they're like the scouts. Yeah. And so this is a terminology that was given to the disciples when they, you know, they became, they were disciples when they were learning. Right. And then it's the same people that are apostles that now are going out and doing the Great Commission. Yeah. I always got those two yeah. confused. Like, yeah, there are other people that are apostles and, yeah. So, like yeah. when did they switch? Well, exactly. when they, when they went from they being graduated. students <laughs> to, right, exactly. to the, right. So, um, so the apostles are then given the ability from the Holy Spirit to recall accurately the words and deeds of Jesus and in, to interpret them rightly for subsequent generations. And uh, there's different things in John that you can look up. Peter and Paul realize the Holy Spirit allows Christ to speak through us and that the directives to the church are not merely their own but commands of the Lord, 1 Corinthians. Apostles then have the authority to write words that are God's own words, equal in truth, status, and authority to the words of the Old Testament scriptures. They do this to record, interpret, and apply to the lives of believers the great truths about the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. And if you really want to know what's happening with the Holy Spirit, because remember, Jesus died on the cross, okay? And the ladies were the first ones to go see right. him. Right. No, he right. wasn't there, obviously. Right. Well, actually, they did see him, you know. And then they went back. And the guys were like, no, I don't believe you, you know, and they had to go back and yeah. see for themselves and everything. But they were all in hiding, you know, and of course then they didn't believe them. So then they went back to this upper room and they're like, you know, everybody's inside and they don't know what they're doing. And in the meantime, you know, Rome is going around and trying to wound, round up all these Christian, you know, they weren't called Christians yet, but the followers of Jesus mm -hmm. and trying to get them out of there because that was, you know, the Pharisees didn't want them there. That was a whole other sect that was coming along. So they're all quiet, and they're trying to figure out what are we going to do, and oh, nobody see us, let's, you know, escape at night and everything. Then that Sunday no afternoon, evening, Jesus shows up mm -hmm. and, you know, gives them the Holy Spirit. That's when the tongues come and everything. Mm -hmm. 
And then what do they do? And then Jesus leaves, of course. And then what do they do? What do they do? Right after that? Yeah, Monday morning. What do they do? Start. Yeah. Start. Peter goes right out. Right. And he's, yeah. he goes right out and yeah. he converts like 3,000 people and he's out in the open. All of them do. So what was the difference? Oh, it's Holy Spirit. Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. And they saw it. Mm -hmm. Same with Paul, who really didn't see, you know, the resurrection. He yeah, no. saw Jesus on the road as a vision or whatever. Yeah. But um, Jesus gave him that view mm -hmm. because there's no way that Paul would have continued on with all of his mm -hmm. stoning, which meant he, he died, mm -hmm. came back. When you get stoned, you know, they left him for dead. Right. And his shipwreck four times. Right. 10,000 miles on sandals. <laughs> <laughs> and he was beat up on the bottom of his feet. Uh -huh. And he kept walking. Mm -hmm. And he went all the way to Nero, because mm -hmm. he was supposed to go and see the kings. Mm -hmm. We're doing Paul. I'm oh, I answered that question yeah. on Sunday. I'm like, <laughs> go to Rome. And then he didn't even say it. I was like, what? <laughs> and, um, and he didn't care. You know, he knew mm -hmm. where he was supposed to go. He knew the timing and all that. Mm -hmm. Holy Spirit. All right. So, so do not be afraid, because the Lord is with you. All right, we should not expect anything to be added to the canon. Um, Revelation, here we go, 22, 18, 19. John writes the last statement in the last book of the Bible. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. The end. So there you have it. I thought that was kind of interesting, because he says it earlier, you know, yeah. and then here it is how it, it, it ends up at the end there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's chapter three. Mm -hmm. So let's, um, Shelly, you want to read the, the poem at the end of, or uh, the um, verse at the end of chapter three? Sure. Okay. <laughs> Him. Let's see. Uh, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. Is there talking Yep, about? there we go. In the many and various ways God spoke of old to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah. And remember, um, if you're getting into the language, what is it? It's uh, the word? Mm -hmm is Logos and Rhema, right? It could be Rhema. translated two different ways. Am I doing what is Hebrew, is it Rhema? Greek, right? What? Logos obviously is the written word. Yeah. And I think Rhema, is that correct? That's yeah. the R-I-G-M-A, Rhema. Well, that's, uh, that's the Bible. Um, Kenneth Hagin? Right? It's a revelation to yourself, like personally. Right, an inspiration. But okay. it's the breath, remember when God breathed right. the life into Adam. Right. You know? Right. So that was, and, then, and it goes back and forth, because when you see the word, we see the word only as word in English. But if you get into the background, if you get one of those translation Bibles, sometimes it's Rema, which means God breathed, inspired, okay. or Logos, Logos, which is the written the scripture. Written word. Yeah. Okay. And then a word of God incarnate. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not familiar with that one. But... Um, it shineth like a beacon, chart and compass, that or like surging sea still guides the gems of truth. They see thee face to face. Seriously, read some of this stuff. There's nice little nuggets and you know, pick, pick different things. You know, you got six chapters each week, maybe before you go to bed or part of your daily devotion in the morning. Um, all right, so let's see how we're doing here. 42. Let's press. If that's okay with you guys. Right. We'll go for another 10 minutes, then we'll take a break. So the four characteristics of scripture, did I get there? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. Um, we're going to talk about authority, okay? How do we know that the Bible is God's word, and what does the whole Bible teach us about itself? So there's four characteristics or attributes of the scripture. Um, in summary, they'll be in the next few chapters, but authority, so who's giving it? You know, it's uh, official dumb, you know, that you should pay attention. Clarity, to be clear, necessity in our life, and then sufficiency, that we can live off of this. 
So explanation and scriptural basis, the authority of scripture means that all the words in scripture are God's words in such a way that to, to disbelieve or disobey any word of scripture is to disbelieve or disobey God. Where did you guys hear that before tonight? Read it one more time. Um, the authority of scripture means that all the words in scripture are God's words. What does that sound like? It's a basis of assumption. One of our basis of assumption. That we are taking the Bible. No matter, because some people say, oh, well, this part is true, but this one, not so much. And then over here, you know, I can take that part out. But, you know, when you start doing that, What's, what's going on in that, that process? Yeah, you're removing things. You're yeah. And it's human driven. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So, um, and so, and Billy Graham had a moment at one point, too, as part of before he became a preacher. Um, he went out, like, on his, his family farm or something, and he sat on a stump and really had his come to Jesus moment. Yeah. And, you know, because he was wrestling with this. I mean, he had been a youth pastor and his career was going off, you know, I mean, it's pretty amazing, um, you know, what he had done in all of his life. And he's probably preached to more people in the whole world with his evangelism, you know, in the last 60, 70 years than the whole world up to this point. <laughs> just amazing with the technology that keeps up. But he sat down on a stump, you know, and he, he just prayed and he said, you know, I'm making a choice. And he had his Bible and I am going to believe that everything in this Bible is from God. And after that, he was talking, because he was wrestling with it back and forth. Yeah. But when he made that choice, right. you know, and it's even like when we first make that choice to believe in Jesus really as our Savior, not just because it was spoon fed to us from, you know, Sunday school, and, and I want to be with my family, and I want to do all the traditional stuff, but when you really make that personal choice to really believe, I mean, when you really have really what happened, what God did came down as a human. God came down as a human. So that we could connect with God because we couldn't do the covenant with God. God made all these covenants, but the problem was God, who could never be wrong, was making a covenant with people who could be. And that was, I think, in Bob Nunn's class, when the, the, the yeah. covenant, if you guys took that class, that was a light bulb that came on. It's like, wow, God's really smart. He went and made a covenant pretty much with himself. <laughs> yeah, <with> himself. <laughs> so I'm like, hey, what do I think of that? And there's a, there's a half a human in there too. But because it's between God and Jesus, it's for eternity. Right. And, you know, it's just amazing. And so when you get to that point, it's just like, oh, an awe moment. All right, so back, to, back on track here. So all the words in scripture are God's words. So. And that's our assumption going in with this class. You guys can figure out what you want to do with that. You know, if you're not there yet, sometimes I go back and forth. It's like, well, I don't know, the Noah thing, and I don't know, was the whole earth, you know? <laughs> and was there two animals on everything? <laughs> two mosquitoes? I mean, you can see where it comes in. You know? like, How is that done? But then when I saw the movie with Russell Crowe, yeah. I thought that was pretty cool. How they yeah, were cool. That we were being revealed to make the movie with what we know, you know, with with what we're trying to do to go to Mars, right. you know, if we're going to start, we got to go take animals and plants and all that stuff for a six month journey. I mean, yeah. and we live in Kennedy Space Center territory, <laughs> so you know, yeah. but there's one going to Mars right now with a helicopter on it. Leader yeah. February, so so yeah, so who knows? Only God knows. Yeah. All right. So all the words in Scripture are God's words. Peter says that no scripture came from man, but that man, moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. And uh, there's things throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. We can go back and forth on that. Um, Paul also, again, to the rest, in Paul's opinion, I say, not the Lord, not Jesus' words. This is an amazingly strong affirmation of Paul's own authority. If he did not have any words of Jesus to apply to a situation, he would simply use his own words for his own words had just as much authority as the words of Jesus. Okay? Again, remember that. Each one of us, now that we have accepted Jesus and have the Holy Spirit in us, what are we? 
We are all, because Brian said he does, you want to be a pastor. Or you are trying, you're, you're pastoring. But we are all pastors and priests, male, female, even children, because, you know, God speaks to us all. Once we have the Holy Spirit, we're all priests of God. What's that class we took? And he said we were little priests. That was Christmas. 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 Oh, yeah. <laughs> and that was the big yeah. yeah, we grow up and it's like, oh, the pastor, he's the one or she's the one yeah. that I need to go through to God. And that's the whole thing about Jesus. He tore the curtain down from top to bottom, which meant God brought it down, mm -hmm. not from bottom to top. God took that curtain down from top to bottom. And that thing was huge. I think it's 70 feet tall. Mm. You had a foot you thick made out of leather. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You had the, you, was it like 70 yeah, feet tall? Yeah, Pastor Dan was talking about it more and more breath. Ah, but it was yeah. a foot thick that was made out of animal hides. Yeah. Like, the weight of that. How yeah. do you carry that around? <laughs> yeah. Amazing. That's why you get deeper and deeper. And, and how things are, I mean, you get into the details, you would think, oh, it's from the bottom. Top, top down. And then the symbology of that. Yeah. That they could go into the inner sanctum now. There was nothing there. So we are actually purified so we can go into God. Mm -hmm. and, you, and that's another thing. Why was Adam and Eve thrown out of the garden of Eden? Sin. And what does that mean, sin? What does sin mean to you? Separation they, from God. Disobedience. Yeah, they, that's right. When they against his word. Yeah. And, um, uh, Sin also means like missing the mark. Mm -hmm. You know, so so that's kind of the basic thing. They're missing the mark. They're no longer perfect. Right. And God can't have anything imperfect in his presence. He, it would destroy that. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting to me, he wasn't punishing them, you know, you know, to get them out of the garden. Mm -hmm. He was protecting them mm -hmm. because of his holiness. They would have been like burnt to a crisp because he's just so pure. And they were no longer pure. They couldn't walk with him anymore. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, because at this point they had sinned, and if they got the tree of um, life or whatever, mm -hmm. then they wouldn't be able to continue their sin without you know, eternal. dying. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, eternally. And it was interesting, too, because that was in Bob Nunn's thing, because at that point, you know, they didn't realize they were naked, mm -hmm. you know, right. with God. Now they were naked. So, mm -hmm. what did God do? Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. And who did, what did he pull them with? An Kill an animal. And who were these animals? Well, he had made them. His and Adam named them. They're probably his friends. Exactly. Mm -hmm. They're our pets yeah. nowadays. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine wearing your pet skin? Oh, I'd eat my pet if I had it too. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, That's when you think of that, okay. that. And, and to carry that weight, that here was this beautiful animal that you had named, and now, because of what you had done, and you, you were afraid of your nakedness or whatever, that you had to be covered. And that was like the first sacrifice, the animal sacrifice, and the blood, and all that. And that goes on you know, with some details there. So again, more, a little bit more in the background there. Um, so let's see. So we're just talking about authority here. Uh, in John, Jesus promised the Holy Spirit would come. And then, again, once you turn it over to the Holy Spirit, it's God speaking. It's not you. And that should give you um, courage. Because, like before, when I would get up in front of speaking, and they say that's the worst thing, you know, number one on the list is public speaking over death. <laughs> Fear of. Oh. But, you know, when you say, okay, I've turned it over to God, you walk up there, you take a breath, and then... And it's God. It's not me. And, you know, before it was my tribe. Oh, am I going to say something wrong? Are they not going to like me? Oh, I can never show my face again. It doesn't matter because I'm clothed with God. And he loves me no matter what. He already loves me. I'm a beloved child of God. Worthy. Right. All right. We are convinced that the Bible's claims to be God's words as we read the Bible. Our ultimate conviction comes only when the Holy Spirit speaks in and through the words of the Bible to our hearts. So that's why you should pray for the Holy Spirit to come in. Okay, thank you very much. We're at time. Yep. Um, let me just see if I can finish. Where am I at here? Um, last line. Second to last line. Yep. Okay. 
So um, as people read scripture, they begin to hear the Creator's voice speaking, because you're seeing it through different ears and eyes. And other evidence is useful, but not fully convincing. Um, it's helpful to, for us to learn that the Bible is historically accurate, that it is internally consistent, that it contains prophecies that have been fulfilled hundreds of years later, that it has influenced the course of human history more than any other book, that it has continued changing the lives of millions of individuals throughout its history, that through it people come to find salvation, it has a majestic beauty and a profound depth of teaching, unmatched by any other book, and that it claims hundreds of times over to be God's very words. All of these arguments may be useful to remove obstacles of our believing. And there's, uh, you know, Westminster Minster Confession of Faith. But when you think about it, every time you pick up the Bible, you know, it's weird. I mean, I'm sure you've done it. If you pick up the Bible and just open the page, yeah, and then say, okay, this is what I'm going to read today. How did he know? <laughs> How did he know? That's what I mean. He always yeah. knows. Yeah, it's strange. Okay, well, we'll take a break, and uh, we'll come back at... Uh, where are we, 9 o'clock? How about 5 after 9? We went a little bit over. That could be said for the sermon. So, you know, so if you're really um, needing to hear something, you know. Yes. You really, you do you do get what you need. Yeah. 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 Not just the eeny, meeny, miny. Exactly. You know. Yes. Yeah. I think part of that's just because God will pull out what you need. Like, yeah. It could be a totally different subject, but God's yep. like, yeah, that's that tiny little. Absolutely. Yep. Be still and know that he is God. That's right. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Yeah, that's one of my favorites. Yeah. All righty. And what you'll find out as you're reading through these books, because this really does, you know, a lot of it will be the same, but sometimes you have to hear it mandatory two or three bachelor. times. Uh -huh. Right? This class yeah. is mandatory for your bachelor's? Yes. You took it already, because you got your pressures. Yeah, this, is brand new. this is updated. We didn't have the requirements before. We had more and some others, oh. but the specific bachelor's track has been officially oh. cemented as of this year. Because oh. I'm like, you already graduated. What are you doing? Oh. Sitting in that's, why, that's why as part of their master's, any of those officials that they didn't get to have prior, they're taking on during their master's. Oh. So it makes 